Welcome to Universally Speaking with Raheem Islam on 860 AM WNOV, The Voice. I am your co-host, Tosha with a P, and we are so excited. We are back here on Monday. We're excited. (laughs) No, you said so excited. So excited. Speaking for yourself, right? No, you're excited too. (laughs) Okay, I'm excited. You know how I know you're excited? Because I already have your latest installment yep. of your yep. next article yep. two yeah. days before it's due. Ain't that something? So I know you're excited. I got it done. <laughs> you got it done. Get the ears. So I already know you're excited, even if you don't want to admit it. I know you're excited. Welcome. Welcome to the show. Our host, Raheem Islam, is live in the studio. We are taking your calls at 414-444-5250. Yes, don't adjust your dials. You do not have the wrong day, although I've been a little confused today as to what day it is. It is Monday. <laughs> it is Monday, 3 p.m., 860 a.m. WNOV. You're listening to Universally Speaking with Raheem Islam. And we are going to get a chance because we always run out of time. We are going to talk about Universally speaking, we're going to talk about Got that to give name. the people what they want. That's right. We're going to talk about the article. We're going to talk about the radio show. We're going to talk about that whole universally speaking movement. And especially this latest installment of giving the people what they want. We came in with that song written by yo. My main man. Yo main man. Yeah, Kenny Gamble, <laughs> Leon Huff. Kenny Gamble. They coined the, uh, the song, uh, uh, got to give the people give the people what they want and i you know when i l- started looking at the lyrics of that song it's so appropriate i mean it was like i mean the song was written produced in 75 that's a little while ago yeah so we're talking about what 25 let me do the math <laughs> See, not divi- <laughs> not divided by not carried us. carried by not <laughs> over not and it's, that's 40 years yeah. i got it you did it. Ding, ding, ding. I did log math. <laughs> <laughs> Not new math. That wasn't new no, math. No, that wasn't new math. I did log math. Uh, in fact, new math, I guess, just could put it in the, in the, <laughs> in the calculator. In the calculator. Yeah, right, right, right. No, I did log math, but I got 40 years, 40 years ago. Um, but there were a lot of things 40 years ago. Not only is the conditions the same um, from a negative perspective, but some of the positive conditions have changed that makes our job a challenge even more difficult mm-hmm. today. We have a call. Caller, you have a question or a comment. Welcome to the show. Uh, yes. Good afternoon, Ms. Davis. Good afternoon, JT. How are you doing? I'm good. I'm blessed. How are you today? Okay. I just called to talk to the boss man. Boss man? Yeah, Raheem. Minister <laughs> Raheem. Raheem. Hey, Raheem. Good afternoon, my brother. How are you doing? All right, sir. How about yourself? I'm fine, thank you. What I want to say, Raheem, is thank you very much for being brave enough to tell the truth to the black community like you do. And Raheem, I'd be willing to call you Minister Raheem, but you you already <laughs> checked me on that. You already, you already see. I ain't not no Minister Raheem and stuff like that, but Raheem, what you're doing so far, sir, I respect and I appreciate it, and thank you so very much. And Raheem, what I want to say, uh, you know, we got these uh, things going on in communities and worldwide and stuff as far as police officers doing what they do to the black community and stuff like that, which I'm sure you're going to talk about. But Raheem, we have a a, a representative, uh, uh, Jackson, and uh, what you want to do is uh, not necessarily be punitive or anything like that. Because, uh, excuse me, let me back up for a second. What she's trying to do, she's trying to, since she's a senator, uh, write a bill that uh, will be punitive on young black men when every time they do something, once in enough time and stuff like that. What she was trying to say is she wasn't going after everybody for that, sir. She was going after the people that do it all the time in our community. So, Raheem, only thing I want to say to you, uh, as we, as you know, sir, in the state of Milwaukee, Wisconsin, or state of Wisconsin, we have Republicans in our office, okay? And, uh, Raheem, please thank you for 
or something might call and listen to me, sir. But what I'm trying to say respectfully is I respect I respect her bill as she written it. If she and uh, you might not know what I'm talking about, sir. No, I, I know what you're talking about. Okay, all right. So Thank Raheem, you. only thing I want to say, she wrote that bill, okay, and uh, Republicans is going to pass it. But as you know, in the state uh, anywhere was Republican control, they're going to stomp on it and they're going to alter it. Even though she had a good heart, bless her heart, she tried to do the right thing for her community. But once it get into the hands of the people that's oppressing us, they're going to stomp on it and they're going to alter that. So Raheem, on them on sir, what you think about that? Well, uh, hang up, hang up and listen. Okay, thank, thank you for thank you for your call. Um. I think that, generally speaking, um, um, we've seen this playbook before a couple of times. Um, under the guise of, um, of um, you know, cracking down on crime, um, we create, um, in, the, in the public, we create um, kind of a mass hysteria that will allow us now to uh, support um, almost anything. And I think the it's very clear that mandatory sentencing is just not a good thing for, um, under no circumstances, and specifically for our community. Um, the three strike law um, that we've seen across the country, right. um, the crackdown or the uh, the war against uh, uh, drugs. Um, and when you look at all these public policies um, and and laws that was created as a result of. Uh, creating um hysteria within the public in a public opinion um and these solutions are absolutely idiotic i mean they're really not smart solutions um they're not the best that we can come up with when it comes down to how do we deal with um, um the significant disadvantage that many of our young people uh, are led down and so led towards based on um, a lifestyle that um, is void of education opportunities or ec equitable edu education opportunity, equitable family structure, community life, and equitable economic opportunities. Um, so you put that there, so you're going to create, if you, if you do those things very well, you're going to create a product that that will be able to maximize and optimize the laws, uh, these kind of mandatory sentencing laws, so you'll get candidates for it. The question is, who are the candidates? Nine times out of ten, those candidates will be disproportionately African-American. And they will further, further dilute and, and weaken and undermine our ability as a community and as a group to deal with the issues that we're dealing with when we're constantly looking at our black male and our black, our young black men um, being um, fallen to these holes, they're now going to become participants and um, um, good participants as it relates to the rebuilding of our communities, the rebuilding of our families. And so if we keep losing black men at the rate we're losing, we're never going to be able to pick up and get to where we need to get to. So I'm I'm not I'm not I'm f all for um, um, smarter smarter um, um, strategies for dealing with the issue of crime. But I know the root of crime. I know the root problem of crime, and it appears that that America and many people in America uh, don't want to address the issue that really is the purpose and the reason for crime. Um, is when you see. Um, long-term education failure, you see long-term economic disinvestment in neighborhoods, uh, uh, predominantly black neighborhoods. And <clears throat> all of this comes back to something that we keep. Poverty is the key thing that we keep talking about. It's, it's amazing how, regardless of what the discussion is, it comes back to two things. To me, it's just the other side of a coin we talked about we're talking about poverty today and friday we talked about it's economics right and really and, there well poverty and if the, if, you, if you really really truly look at the the, the the word poverty 
it is an economic term. Exactly. You know, it's really about it's, um, not having enough resources to cover your basic needs, um, food, clothing, and shelter. Um, and so if you're unable to cover your basic needs, the question's got to be, well, why? What what are the what are the reasons why you're why are you uh, why are you in poverty or near poverty? And and some would say, well, um, just pull up your bootstrap. You know, I ain't got just, no boots. Well, yeah, exactly. <laughs> no boots and maybe no legs, and no feet. feet. <laughs> Shoot, no feet, no boots, nothing. No hands, no arms to pull. <laughs> so so kind of really have to now look at economics as a race as a race as a as a as a as a a, a, a uh, uh, not something you look at as you don't take a snapshot of economics today and make an assumption you have to look at economics over a period of time you, if you take a snapshot today, it's an unfair snapshot because you're not taking consideration that this has been a race and that, unfortunately, the African-American community has not been a participant in this race. And it appears, if you take the snapshot today, it appears like, oh, we're going to make it seem like we all on an equal, equal. playing field. Right. But the reality is nothing could be further from the truth. So that conversation also brings us back and I love that there's always a common thread um, and people don't really know or understand and you know maybe one day they will but I, I think people probably didn't know or understand uh, Malcolm X or Martin Luther King Jr. So they probably don't get your uh, articles. Some people might uh, get them when they read them but there is definitely if there's anyone that reads them on a regular basis that there is a common thread and a common theme, even though there's a different uh, topic or subject that you approach with each article or each series, there is still a common thread that is weaved throughout all of them. And it's basically our community and what it is we can do to make our community better and to organize our community. And this latest installment of uh, giving the people what they want, which was coined by Gamble and Huff. Uh, we talked in the first installment about freedom, and then we moved on, and we kind of, in that one, d discussed what freedom is, what, what freedom look like, looks like, and what the de definition of freedom really is. And then we kind of moved on to justice, um, you want to talk a little bit about that? Yeah, I think the um, what the point I was trying to make the first the first point um, was, you know, I really I'm I'm on a on a um, a path of of learning myself. So it's not like I'm coming and I'm I'm uh, I have some ideas about some things, you know, I have some general ideas, but. But I'm learning myself. And I'm learning when we talked about freedom, we put a lot of, we put a lot in that word, freedom. But the real freedom in a capitalist society that we haven't even put a lot of word in is economic Economics. freedom. And I heard somebody told us to say that we are the highest paid slaves in the world. And I used to try, well, what, what does that mean? And it means that if you're unable to, a slave is unable to, to chart a path of self-determination because he is captured or she is captured. She is in the control of somebody else. And she is being, he or she is being used solely and exclusively economically by someone else. That's a slave. Well, if we are unable to chart our own self-determination... That means we're paid slaves. Right. So, and by standards around the world, we're the highest paid slaves in the world. So, now kind of understand when he was saying that, what he really meant. Who said that? 
I'm not even sure. Somebody was telling me. I'm not sure exactly who it was, but uh-huh. it, it, it was like you know through a general conversation right, here. Right. Somebody say, "Man, we're the highest paid slaves, you know, on the planet." I said, "Well, can let me let me just dive into, into that, that a little bit and, and figure what that really means." But I started to get into the concept of freedom, justice, and equality, and we want freedom, justice, and equality. And it went back to the song that Kenny and K- Gamble and Huff wrote: "Give the people what they want." And by the way. Uh, Keon, you was playing it early. We was jamming on that song. <laughs> not I mean, even, we, but, right. but but I'm not sure if everybody got, you know. And and in the song, it's talked about. Uh, it, we've been all over around the world, and it's a unanimous decision, and everybody feels the same. It's a unanimous decision. I said they're ready for a change. You got to give the people what they want. And what the we people was well, all about time things to get better. We want the truth, the truth, and no more lies. I'm like, man, this is some <laughs> <laughs> this is some powerful stuff. We want the truth. Don't we want the truth today? We see what's going on around the country and we tired of this nonsense. We want the truth. The people don't want they want the truth. What do the people want? They want the truth. They're tired of be playing. So when you start talking about the concepts of freedom, justice, and equality, what type of freedom? What type of justice? Right. What type of equality? It's not enough to say we want to be free. The freedom we want in America is economic freedom. Because everything is tied to your economic status. Exactly. Everything. If you want a good education, you got to pay for it. Right? Exactly. If you want to get experience, you got to have some kind of capacity to learn something it's going to cost. If you want to open a business, you got to it's going to take money. Everything cost. Nothing. If you want to we talked about poverty. If you want to be able to control some of your basic needs, food, clothing and shelter. It takes money. It takes resources. So the freedom that we need is economic freedom. And so as long as that piece is not happening, it's going to be really crippling. And so what I did was now tripped into the area of justice. And I do we have a Yeah, we have a caller. Well, we can go we, take a call. Yeah, we're going to take the call. And, and then I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about justice. Okay. Caller, you have a question or comment? Yes, I have a quick comment. How are you uh, this afternoon? Good. How are you? Thank you for calling. Fine. Thank you. Uh, I'm fine. There's another song that I hope that you maybe um, your engineer can play. It's um, Ball of Confusion. That hit me the other day. I, they played it on the radio. It is so heavy. You know, you would think back then. I'm from way back. Not way, way back then, but <laughs> I'm from the old school. And when I heard it on the radio, oh, my God, it hit me like a ton of bricks. People moving out. People moving in, why? why not? Because right. of the color of their skin. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> and, 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 and the other thing that I want to say is, like, you know, what what I, okay, well, what, what, what are some of the solutions? Okay, I, I'm about solutions. So I say, you know, with, I'm a mature woman, and I think that it's about time for the sisters that, that are out there that are able to start talking to the younger Sisters, if they're willing to listen and say, hey, baby, let me show you how to bake. Let me show you that you you don't have to always wear pants. It's okay if that's what you want to do. But it's all right to wear a dress, too, because you are a woman. It's, it's time for us to start helping our young ladies to become a mothers, help them with motherhood, because some of their mothers might be gone. Some of their grandmothers might be gone. Their mom, you know, I've been there. I've done that. And I think that whether if it's not in the church, it might be just right on your block. So let's just come out of these shells. And if it means to be, it's a mission, it is our duty as a black woman, whatever it is, to help our young sisters. Now, the brothers, snatch the men up. But I'm speaking to the sisters right now. And that's, that's what my goal is. This year. Well, thank you. I think that um, that's one of the things I think that we're tr- we're challenged with is some solutions, but clearly, 
what you just described is something we have to do. Um, and we got to do more of it. Here's what I think that um, part of the solution that I'm I'm pushing for is organizing our community. Uh, when I say organizing our community, different sectors and, 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 and groups within the community. The fundamental um, um, solution to all of these issues is that we are we have significantly uh, divided our abilities. Um, they have divided by generation. They're divided now by class. They're divided by politics. They're divided by religion. Um, and 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 there are quite a few more, but the 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 big ones are religion. Um, even in Christianity, there are this multitude of different um, uh, sects or um, denominations, denominations. Um, within the religion that have not allowed those denominations. In fact, many of the denominations were offsets of offshoots of of one denomination Domination, or another, right. that and that historical kind of baggage still exists and and while it might have been a hundred years ago they have never come back to come right. together to right. work together. together then there's the denomination um, religious uh, where people believe in religion and some don't um, there are the the whole separation of people who have lost faith in organized religion and there are probably more of them than than uh, that are actually in religion but even those who are in religion are divided amongst themselves. Um, there are then you have those who have you know become Muslim and and then those who become you know Hindu or whatever. Um, and and give you an example, the Italians. Probably ninety five percent of the Italian community is Catholic. Mm -hmm. So. If you're going to compare one group, the blacks against the Italians, if you come from one organized religion, then they, they have a significant competitive advantage over us because we're everything. Right. We're everything plus. Um, second is look at the Irish. They're either Catholic or Protestant. Right. So they have a comp look at the, the the look at the the Asians. They're one one religion. I mean, it's over you know a billion of them, but when they come over to America, they still one. They practice one pretty much one way of life religiously, and I'm not I'm not condoning one religion over another. I'm just talking about the competitive advantage one group has over another because they go to the same church. They go to the same place of worship. They're coming from the same orientation, from a worship perspective. And when we come as a community, we come from multitudes of orientations from a worship perspective. We are divided at the beginning. Class. Class has always been a divider in the white community. But now it's dividing the black community. All right. Now you have... We have black, I talked about it, the black one percenters. Um, we have black people who now, who have now been, in, in, um, I guess, led into traditional white establishments, whether it's housing, whether it's the clubs, whether it's uh, the social clubs, the social networks, whether it's the resort areas and the vacations, whether it's uh, the employment. Now they're in... And they frown and they look down to their brother and sister. Now, they're not going to say it, but we see it. Mm -hmm. I mean, I see it in this whole situation in Baltimore. I've seen a couple of so-called athletes chastising those who were protesting. I guess they were talking about more of the ones who was creating some kind of the violence and some of the, some of the uh, violence that was taking place. And they were, you know... Uh, you know, really come after them, but the point of it is they have no idea. They they have they have removed themselves so, from community. black life. Right. They don't know nothing about it because they're now class. So you couple all these things together, and we're completely divided. So to the sister's point, it's a long way, but to the sister's point, 
what part of solution has to be organizing us, bringing us back to the circle, bringing us back to the table, letting the division, showing the division has divided us and I divided our capacity and our ability to deal with some structural issues. That's why I'm talking about freedom, justice, and equality. I'm talking about freedom is economic freedom, and we have a chance to deal with economic freedom we got to be physically free, but we got to be mentally free. Exactly. And part of our mental f uh, uh, slavery is our inability to see us as one. And it ain't going to be no where we all going to be in love with each other. That ain't what I'm talking about. I'm talking about functional. I'm talking about structural and functional cooperation where we're working together and we're closing some of these divides, whether it be religious, whether it be political, whether it be class. We have to do that. And so our approach to do that, we've started in Philadelphia, is the Philadelphia Community of Leaders, which we want to do here in Milwaukee, is bring people who are leading efforts in different places to come together to create one table and place where we can have a conversation about some of these very, very tough issues. Well, we've actually started having those conversations here in Milwaukee. And sometime within the next, I would say, six to eight months that'll be coming together in a real way not just discussion so for those who heard us talk about it it's actually happening and it's not an elitist thing it's a table where everybody can be at the table and be involved but the structure has to be put in place so that everybody can come to the table there's two approaches one approach is the now <clears throat> and another is the approach is the future the future approach is our schools yes that's why we're opening schools. That's why we're running schools. That's why we're attempting to instill in our children a, a love for their self, a love for their community, and an obligation to, the community. to their community, to the struggle. Because what we have been taught, it's obvious that we have been taught a no kind of um, connection to our plight right? as if somebody's going to do for us what we need to do for ourselves as some magical things going to happen to deal with the issues of freedom justice and equality we're not going to have freedom until we get economic freedom we're not going to have economic freedom until we understand the value of the group the collective the right. collective so there's two approaches. One is what can we do now in organizing our leaders? Second is how do we now begin to instill that into our children? And that's what Universal is all about, our schools. That's why we're opening schools. So it's a two-pronged approach. It's, it's a, it's a, a short-term and a long-term approach. But the goal is to produce a cohort of students who are academically on par with anybody. But they're not getting an education to get out. No, they're getting an education to they, stay they're in. They're getting an education to stay in. Right. They're getting an education to say, my education is my obligation is to the people. My obligation is to our community. And if I see in my mind things that could be better, it is up to me to prepare myself as a young adult to become an adult that I can be part of the solution and not part of the problem because we got too many people who are talking they're talking about the problem but they're part of the problem and so if you're not working together I don't care where you are I don't care what group you're part of you got to be able to say, what am I doing with the collective? What, 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 how am I connected to the whole? Or I'm just doing my little thing here. I have no connection to what's with the whole. Because Th there's no whole, there's there. no place we go. Right. But you got to force that. We have to force that dialogue. We have to force that kind of conversation. And if it's not being taught... It's not going to happen organically. If it's not being instilled, it's not just going to, we wake up one day and it's just going to happen. It has to 
be purposeful. Absolutely. I mean, it's no question about it. And that requires some thought. That requires strategy. But it also requires understanding, um, diagnosing the problem. Meaning that you just can't, you can't, you know, treat, you know, somebody who has cancer and treat them as if they have a cold. Exactly. You know, you have to treat them as if they have cancer. And for us, for what we're working at, what we, where we are and what we're up against, we, we're at that level of, of diagnosis. Um, we have a serious illness in our community. And that illness is called division. That illness is called disunity. That illness is caused, um, you know, has divided us and and minimized our our ability to aggregate not only mental but our resources to begin to address some of these issues. And a long way about this here, what the sister asked about, or what can be done, or what she's doing. Um, we have to create models so that um, you can point to right. and say, there it is. That's what we want. We, this, is the, this is the model we're looking at. This is what we want. Well, we see our young girls dressing adequately and pro properly. Right. They're, not f they're not 12 and 13 years old. As soon as they start to expose or something, they grow their body. They're looking to their physical body to promote themselves. Right. They can't wait to show their breasts and their and their, and their and their butts and their legs and their body when they should be doing just the opposite. opposite. They can't wait because they looking for attention. When and I was writing again, I, I pulled I stopped writing because it was be too controversial. And I was saying what what happens when our girls when they don't have daddies that say that they love them? What happens when the girls, the little girls, never hear a man of authority who protects and provides for them are saying, I love you. Or you're beautiful. Or you're beautiful. So by the time they're 12 and 13 years old, that's when they, they kind of transition. They maybe even transition a little yeah, earlier. Yeah, yeah. But as soon as they get a little growth, they're trying to now take off all of their clothes mm -hmm. and because they believe somebody has taught them that that is their validation that's where that's that's their real measurement right but that's not their validation that's not their measurement they're much bigger than that but so we have to create models trust me i was when i was shoot 10, 11, 12 years, I was chasing girls. Look, look, we, I, we play any kind of game we could play. <laughs> catch a girl, kiss a girl, catch a girl, hug a girl. I mean, but the girls ain't do that stuff. I mean, we we might have got one or two that were a little, little, a little, 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 yeah, little yeah, fast. Yeah, yeah, a little <laughs> fast. And they, but everybody knew it. It wasn't the normal. It right. was the exception, not the norm. You you just happened to get lucky. So we have to, yeah, shoot, lucky, yeah. I'm like, yeah, I hit the jackpot. <laughs> But the point I'm making is that those there's a natural dynamics between growing up and experiencing your sexuality is one of those things. But it's at a level now where yes. there's hardly no work has to be done. I mean, these girls are literally, they're wearing these, these tights now where, um, I mean... That was just not un that was just unheard of when I was growing up, and I'm not trying to date myself. It just doesn't make any sense to walk around butt naked. I mean, so, so yeah, there's got to be the attentions, mothers, and the problem is some of these mothers, they're fanning the flames. They believe in those things. That's how they dress, because they're having children, and they're only children themselves. Children having children, yeah. You know, so. For us, we got to create a model. We got to create an environment, a place where we all see that the ideas and concepts we're talking about are working, and they're working in in in, in multiple different ways. But that's what we're attempting to do. We think that at Universal, we think we can do that, starting with schools, then rebuilding out and rebuilding neighborhoods, and then now we put people in those neighborhoods who have these kind of values, who believe in these kind of concepts and are prepared to make some of these sacrifices okay so we're going to take a break we're going to come back 
We're going to talk about justice, and we're going to unpack justice. We're going to talk a little bit more about universal companies and what we're doing outside of the schools, in the schools, around the neighborhoods, and in the community. You are listening to Universally Speaking with Raheem Islam on 860 AM WNLV, The Voice. Welcome back to Universally Speaking with Raheem Islam on 860 AM WNLV, The Voice. Excuse me, please call in with your questions or comments at 414-444-5250. We are taking your calls. Raheem is in studio with us today. He's usually here, but sometimes he's traveling around the country doing what he does best and we're glad but we're also excited to have him here with us do not adjust your radio dial you're not confused it is monday we are now on on mondays and fridays 3 p.m to 5 p.m right here on 860 a.m wnlv so we are so excited as i said when we first started to be here once again on mondays now and before we went to break we were discussing a lot of things <laughs> But we wanted to, when we came back, start talking a little bit about what justice looks like. And that's a word that is used a lot. Um, it's used in a lot of different ways. And we really need to talk about, for us and for our community, what justice really looks like. And I think it was just a wonderful idea when uh, we had part one of Kenny Gamble special show on he talked a little bit about the message in the music we only made it up i think to 19 to the 60s yeah we just just <laughs> peaked our head in the 70s <laughs> just a little bit we're going to do part two actually the first week in june but the fact that we could actually unpack just one line from one of his songs and the significance of the words that were in there you know what made him just say we want freedom justice and equality well i mean we clearly we know what he was referring to but do we really and the fact that those words are just prevalent right now today and so let's we want to talk a little bit and we we want to encourage you definitely to pick up these articles in the milwaukee courier and also go read them online at milwaukeecourieronline.com and they're also in the milwaukee community journal and the madison times and if you happen to be in Philadelphia, they are in the Sunday, the Sunday Sun, the Sunday Sun, and <clears throat> I will get you the other two papers that they're also in in Chicago, Indiana, and in Atlanta. Please forgive me, but needless to say, all you can do is Google Rahim Islam, universally speaking, and you'll find him everywhere on the internet. But we want to unpack justice, and I think people use that term very loosely. You know, I want justice. There ain't no justice for our people. We'll never get justice. And you start talking a little bit about that. Well, um, again, um, I want to make sure clear that um, that we have to define freedom as economic freedom. Okay, um, and when you look at freedom, I, I want to always put it in the context that you're running a race okay you're you're denied from being able to be a true participant but the race is moving anyway okay all right so it's i liken it to the um 100 meter race this is the economic race for america yet we spot the white community 99 meters (laughs) and when they cross that 100 meter threshold mm-hmm. they act like they really won it was fair yeah, yeah it, it was, was a fair, fair but, but the reality is nothing could be further from the truth but that was not enough so justice now we transfer into justice so freedom economic freedom which we know we haven't had in this country and we're significantly behind and it's all about a race now justice we have to look at an america's institutions and how those institutions were formed what's the climate and culture of those institutions and what have they produced so if justice justice in its broadest context is the attainment of that which is is morally just legally just 
equitably just and fair. Okay. Just fair. Fair. Right. So, you know, after the emancipation, you know, do we think that, for example, and I talk a lot about it about in this coming um, article about equality, but let's just put our thinking caps on for a minute. If if in this country we're in an economic race and we were denied for almost 400 years to participate, and then when we're so-called physically free to participate, we're compared with a group that has had three or 400 years of head start over us. So you mean when we were emancipated, we didn't receive all of the economic. Nothing. We didn't get 300, 400 years of economic. No, uh, no, facts. no retributions, no, no reparations, no we money, yeah. no resources, nothing. We were physically free, 100 percent abject poverty. And, 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 handle it. and yeah, you on your own. <laughs> make it happen. Yeah, make it happen. And, and to our credit, we still did some phenomenal things. But the point of. Where justice comes in at is if you look at every American institution, it wasn't enough that we were at this significant economic disadvantage. But when we went to go and uh, participate in American life, every institution practiced racist, racial, racist discrimination against us all the way up into the point of at least until past segregation, technically, where well, I'm calling open, oh legal, oh, open oh, okay. racism, okay. Okay. I was where say, you're not I was allowed gonna, to I do this. I thought you were going to say until like two minutes ago. No, no, no. But technically, well, I, you know, I look at the situation <laughs> right now. Um, it's not legal, right, to discriminate. In fact, if you legally, the courts will support you. But it was a time in this country where it was courts, legal supported right, the right. legal discrimination of black people in every area, whether it's finance, whether it's is commerce, whether it's in education, whatever it is, you name it, we were discriminated right. you can, upon. You, you can let they legislated discrimination, but you right. can't legislate bigotry. What do you mean? Well, someone can be a bigot right. or someone can, you know, we can tell, we can, there's laws against discriminating against people. Right. Well, but the, I want to keep this in the context okay. in the sense that it wasn't enough that we were economically behind. Right. But then then when we, we were free, physically free, and pursued our paths in America, every lost. institution denied us, discriminated upon us, upon us based on our color of our skin, okay. racial discrimination. So we had to fight that. That took another, so 1863, 1864, we didn't get the Civil Rights Acts. So, and the Fair Housing Acts and the Voter Right Acts to the 60s. So that's 60, that's 75 years of fighting institutions for the word fair. Just fair. We didn't ask for special treatment, but just don't discriminate because upon we, us. Because we ain't even got to equality. Right, yet. right. We, right. We're not even got to equality. <laughs> We're just talking about just fair. Right. What's morally fair? What's equitable fair? What is fair? fairness but that wasn't enough so i call it like booby traps so in addition to us being economically almost 100 percent of us impoverished and not compensation for nearly 400 years of, of 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 contributions to a wealth that many of these people enjoy enjoy and participate in and now act as if it never even happened and then we get into systems that have been just categorically denying us access up until I would say the mid 70s and 80s where it became the effects of the Civil Rights Act where there are actual laws or consequences for companies that participate in the practice discrimination right so it took I would say so now we now in the 80s so now the question I would ask to our, our listeners is did that mind just all of a sudden just disappear? Because the outcomes are the same. Right. We still are, when it comes down to every measurement, in every institution we can look at, we can see 
there is a outcome that's being produced where blacks are denied. Now, it might not be legal, and it it's not. It might not even be. Um, I could say many of these institutions are a- operating on autopilot. Okay. Okay. So they're operating from a mindset that that this country was built upon, and that is the discrimination of black people. Okay. For whatever reason, I don't. I still don't know why, but it is a fact. It wasn't enough. You would have think, or you would have thought that what they did to us, they would have told all those institutions now help them, right? Work with them. Let's support them because we owe them. You would have thought, well, but no, thought. just the opposite. Right. Until the day. So justice is we need to deal with justice is structural racism, institutional racism. So the justice that we seek is the justice in America's systems. We see today, even when they can take a, 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 a police officer and beat the stew killer joker, <laughs> shoot video. him six times in the back, <laughs> and it says, well, we, 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 we got to really look at that. Vi- right. We got to really look at it, investigate the video. <laughs> so, so even today, we question the courts. All right. Come on. We don't know what happened. <laughs> come on. It doesn't make any sense. It doesn't make any sense. So justice, we have to have justice. Justice is the justice that we need to have within these systems, in the education system, higher education system. It's not justice. It's not fair what they do to black people. It's just not fair. What was it that Dr. Bonds told us about the neutral? Or what, did he, what did he call it? Um or it's not colored the laws and the legislation the policies that are put in place now that they're oh, oh, the colorblind yeah yeah so they really anti uh anti uh, affirmative action or anti set aside or anti uh anything that's going to give us a quota advantage to repair some of the inequities that have taken over for the last 400 years color neutral or color, right yeah. and but the problem is that even that concept got undermine when the expansion of minorities exactly so minorities in the 60s and 70s was clear black people right but now now minorities, it's, people it's insects <laughs> i mean it's 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 <laughs> I mean, it could mean anything. Anything. It could be, it could be I, could, I could have a damn cat <laughs> fetish. And I said, well, look, I'm a minority because it's because only three of us. I, I, I married seven cats. So why can't I get fit under this minority designation? The here's views, a pervert, right? The views on this show. <laughs> here's, a, here's a damn pervert. Now, how in the world? Because I'm banging cats. I'm not talking about like real animals. Now, all of a sudden, I fit under the minority. Come on. I mean, that's a sickness. So it's been so watered down. <laughs> it's been so watered down that anything fits under there. So black hasn't black people have oh. lost even in that. Even though we've gone full circle that even um, set aside are no longer. Look, but the bottom line is that we have to seek justice within these yeah, systems. We need to be clear like Polly was clear. Just so it ain't no misunderstandings. This is about black and blackness for black people and our black look, community. Look at our financial systems. You can't tell me that um, we're, we're at a significant div- disadvantage. We, I was looking at a, a, a statistic um, when they were looking at the number of, of loan applicant rejected loan applications mm-hmm. whether they be mortgages whether it be car loans whether they be business loans okay. we have a like eight nine times rate disproportionate significantly disproportionate look at our entry into you just take any system just take it, a system. Just, it you, doesn't matter you, you can throw you, you can throw a rock at the wall system, and whatever health you pick, system whatever you pick you it's look at our, our, our health system, you know, and right now, what we're seeing today, if you look at the pipeline, that because what happens is on the verge of the 50s and 60s with the civil rights and the movement, it opened up doors for many of us right. 
Those doors have been closed, and we won't see the effects of those closed doors for another 15, 20 years. But every professional group, lawyers, doctors, architects, are, are reducing right. in numbers. It's closing, those, professional, those professions. Are and it's because the pipeline. Those pipeline now, those institutions are creating standards. Those standards are not achievable. And then we're losing our, our HBCUs, which also produced a lot of those pipelines of professors. Without question. And, and, and that's a whole new different subject. But clearly it is um, those HB, HB historical black CUs were a response to the in equalities or the injustices in the traditional education, education systems. System, right. But if you look at them where many of them have become opted into the state programs, and they are still the least funded out of the state schools. Right. And if, go back to economic freedom. Are we really free? Well, the, the, the issue is that if it requires any kind of uh, finances on our part, it's going to expose something that's fundamentally missing our inability to have resources. Right. And those resources are tied to where we started. But then they'll say, well, you have to have this amount of resource to get in here. Well, how in the world can I get in here? It's impossible. They'll build a, um, a, um, a luxury apartment building downtown and say, well, every one of these units is going to cost $2 million. Well, that right. No <laughs> black people. <laughs> we're like, well, we know what kind of building that's going. So guess what? And it, 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 I ain't got to say. I ain't got to say we're discriminating. Right. I'm just I, saying exactly. that I raise the standard so high that only white people can get it because only traditionally maybe there might be one black person or two black people, and they say, you know, see, you know, look at them. Well, yeah, then we got. Well, no, there's on on the thirtieth floor. Uh, yeah, yeah, there's one there's black that person. Guy. Or two black people, but I said, you know, are we are we really? You know, <laughs> are you we, we, oh yeah, are we serious. We want the truth and nothing else. <laughs> no more lies. And the truth of the matter is, if you raise those standards high enough, then you can just, on an economics perspective, that is tied to kind of economically, and you will knock out a good portion of our community. Why? Because a good portion of our community is impoverished. Exactly. A good portion of our community is either at poverty or near poverty. And is that because we're lazy? Is that because we don't care? Is that because we're shiftless? No. This is because we're at a disadvantage economically. And so when your institutions practice discriminations based on racial discrimination that are masked by what they call like free competition, it says not it's not it's not really truly competition Fishing. if if we need five people and we're gonna say well at least one of them have to be black. Why the other four white people are saying why are we doing that? And now they have won. We're doing that is because in years past they were absolutely illegal to have a black person there. Right. And so to correct the things, this is where affirmative action and, 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 and um, set-asides and quotas came. It says to correct as a measure of fairness, we're going to try to now correct some of those things and say if it's five people we need, we got to have at least one of them to be black. That is somewhat fair. And I, 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 I would say it is. But what happens, those four white lobbied their legislative people and they prevailed and today that one is completely not even part of it so uh you hear uh uh, uh um, you know best effort you hear all kinds of things that are used to say there's not a hard mandatory kind of outcome Best that we're looking for yeah. right or that we couldn't find any there weren't any qualified applicants. right we couldn't we, we put out a <laughs> we, could, we could find no ends <laughs> <laughs> we, we searched we high and low we couldn't find no n words 
<laughs> we searched high and low. We couldn't what? find equality. Every, everyone we found had issues. <laughs> of course they're going to have issues. Why wouldn't they have issues? Why wouldn't black ish- people have issues? Well, you know. If I'm you could compare them to <laughs> white people who've been in. That's like the fourth, fifth generation in business. I'm competing against people who, who got all the money, all the resources, all the contact, all the knowledge, all the know-how. All the all the institutional knowledge. We first time coming. We're going to compete, and and we still even compete, even in the environment. And it's not fair. Please come on. <laughs> so so it's not fair, and so justice is about creating some level of fairness. fairness. But we have to look at each one of these institutions and separate them, and really examine what is fair, what should be fair. As it relates to that system, as opposed to talking about justice, period. Most people think of justice and they're thinking about the court system. The criminal justice system, right. Because we need that. But there are a lot of other things going unnoticed and, and not being touched because we have not expanded the concept of justice. We have not talked about the injustices that are taking place in the different areas. And until we start to talk about those things and address those things, then we're never going to have justice in America. So... This is a little, it's not really off of what we're talking about, but it, it, when you were talking, it made me think about it. And I've mentioned this a couple of times. I really enjoy uh, A&E. I don't watch much TV, but when I do watch TV, I like A&E and I like 48 Hours. Uh, I don't watch the other reality shows, but I like 48 Hours. I like Cold Justice, where they go back and find the old yeah. uh, uh Crimes and what it tells me, but white people be killing, they be killing, <laughs> they killing spice spouses. I mean, it you might get a hundred cases before you get to a black case, right? But I mean, the, but they, they be this, killing this them. Is my point, this is my point. And I really like this intervention show. Which one is intervention? That? Is when it's somebody in their family who just all jacked up. Yesterday, the, last night, the lady was on heroin oh, and drugs. Xanax. Drugs. Yeah. Okay. So they they be addicted, but they don't just be a, like just the alcoholic on beer. They be addicted to like oh, four yeah. different. Oh uh, no, interventions guys gone. They, <laughs> right, they just, right. Yeah, yeah. And I've we, yet to see a black. I've yet to see a black person <laughs> or intervention. Oh, we right? we we got our share, but oh, no, we yeah, got our share, yeah, we got definitely. Our share. So I, I was wondering yesterday, you know, when now go, that's where we we got equitable. <laughs> We we equitable in those areas. We so, got our share of crazy so stuff going on. I'm looking and dysfunction. When they go find the they go find these people and the ladies talking about how much oh my habit, you know, yeah, it's about five, six hundred dollars a day. And you know, I'm looking thinking, who can afford to have this type of a habit and not have a job? And so when you go and you start talking about this whole piece of economics and our communities and justice and equity and all these things. Last night as I'm watching three or four episodes of these people and the money that they're getting their yeah. hands on from the family. Let me tell you, it's, 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 let me tell you it's, being poor on anything <laughs> is bad. If you're a junkie, you're poor. It's good to be rich and junkie. It just be good to be sick and, uh, 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 and be rich. It's 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 good to have money in any of those issues. Right. You follow what I'm saying? You could be a single parent, single mother, single father. You got money. It's it's good. Yeah, you, I ain't, mean, you ain't happy about you, it, but you can make it happen. Dig it. It's it's bad when you ain't got no money. <laughs> and you and you are impoverished. So you're going to get the same issues that all everybody else. You're going to f- suffer with depressions. You're going to se- suffer with health issues. You're going to might get strung out on drugs. You might lose a daughter in prostitution. You all the things that happen to everybody happens to us yes. as well. But it sure makes it much it easier when you be, got look, money. They was looking, I'm telling you. They didn't they didn't look <laughs> I was just so that was just my observation. We have a caller on the line. Caller, you have a question or a comment? Yeah, I do. How you doing? Good. How are you? But, you know, when you mentioned that um, we're in poverty, of course we are, but um, to a certain extent. But, you know, it would be nice if people would say, I don't really want to hear people talk about Caller. jobs all the time. Caller, if excuse me. talk about education. You know, going back to school is a technical trade. You don't have to do a four-year college. But sometimes we can rise ourselves up by going to school. You don't want to be a nickel and dime job every three or four years the rest of your life looking for a different job. You know what I'm saying? Caller, can you turn your radio down? We 
we're having a hard time hearing you. Okay, just uh, no, I, I had it off. Um, oh, okay. Okay, I was driving. I said, you know, I like to hear people say more encouragement about some of what's going on in school. Like, like they, not all white folks go to school either. But going to college, even if you go do a technical trade, you know, you can do technical trades in a variety of things from, from, from electrician to plumbing to heating and air conditioning, uh, dental assistant, you know, things like that. We can go on to do other things. Uh, we don't just have to sit there and say we need to get a job in McDonald's and work our way up to Home Depot and then you work see, you know, you're going to be in and out of jobs all your life. So I would hear you want to say, well, what about going back to school? Even a man, if you're low income, you can go back to school just like females go back to school later on in life. Just, you know, when you get out of high school, just try to go get a technical trade right away if you don't want a four-year college. You know what I'm saying? The other one is that drug dealers, get, they get stuff on credit. Drug dealers get people stuff on credit. So if you got a $400 habit, a lot of people, um, regardless of income, they get stuff on credit. And they have to start giving up their cars, giving up household items if they can't um, pay, the, pay the bill back or they get killed. I mean, they give stuff on credit every day. Drug deals, that's how they roll. Well, I, I, I agree with you, sister. The um I think the um I think the bigger point is no question that um, you know, we should consistently try to enhance our uh, market um, the, the yeah, marketability of our skills so that we can, you know, be able to provide for ourselves. And education is a big part of that, no question about it. Either going back to school or learning a skill, learning a trade. Uh in fact in our schools uh, we we have an academies and the academies are set up to uh, give options for our young scholars to be able to go uh, to a trade. Um, to there are four areas that we want uh, outcomes for our scholars. One, and once they graduate high school, one is to go to college if they choose. Second, or to continue a skill training of their choice. So if they were in the, in the health industry and in, the, in the health academy in the school. Uh, they can continue their training in uh, in one of the um, uh, other schools, uh, uh, post high school schools, uh, two year or even four year programs uh, in the area that they 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 choose. Uh, a third is to um, um, get a job. Um, you know, many of our young people are in need to go into the the labor market immediately, but they coming out of our high school, they they'll be better prepared. And fourth, which is one is, is the toughest, but is one that we've also pushing for, and it's going to take some time for us to develop the curriculums in order for them to be successful, and that's to create their own business. So either going to one graduating, two um, um, as a standard, one going to college, continuing their skill training in the area that they've chosen already. Three, uh, to actually get a job or four, open a business. So uh, we're pushing and promoting those solutions, and uh, we definitely promote and push that for all of our, uh, for the whole listening audience. We have to figure it out. But here's our challenge, and this is the challenge is why we're focusing on. And you, you will, there is a difference, a distinction between, in this country, between wealth, rich, and income. Okay, wealth, rich, and income. And many of the people, for most of black people, were in that area of income. So even recently, I wrote, and I made a mistake, but I, I, I wanted to make clear of it. In, in the Milwaukee Courier, we talked about the whole concept and does the, the black community understand the language of economics? And I said that we constantly hear how the black community earns nearly, I said a billion, but it should have been a trillion dollars in income annually. And, um, and, and this how the, I also talk about how the media defines us and how they depicts us. And they try to promote this as some, some major, major accomplishment for the black community, but nothing can be further from the truth. When you add the amount of unemployment, and underemployment in our community, if you count, you can't factor in the amount of poverty in our community. I think if we were just even just be normal, we need about three or four trillion annually. And so, and it's going to be very, very difficult to go from income to rich, yeah, and f and from and from income and and from income to wealth. Wow. Now, those who get rich. From income are like this guy um, Mayweather um, uh, the other day. 
he he's very rich because he his income was 120 million 130 million well, whatever many, how whatever many, you're right say it again i mean for a little for, bit yeah of time. but that's his income but that's what he earned he earned income now he can take that income and and create p- potentially wealth. wealth potentially but he's a long way from wealth and when you listen to this guy talk all he talked about is how many cars he had how many houses he had I didn't hear not one thing he talked about how he can create wealth or how he can create economic opportunity for those, you know. For others. For others. Because in economic opportunity, you can make money. Right. So so income, it's very hard for income to become rich off of income. You can do well and you can do good. But we're up against people who have, they're not only rich, they have wealth. And so we have to understand that when we start developing strategies, even if they be individual strategies like what the sister was talking about, uh, you know, we should promote more of people going back to school, men right. and women going back to school. Yes, you do. You have to. But that will never get us to where we are to close the gap, the economic gap, and that 99-meter differential that we got we 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 are behind in the game and the problem here is the clock is still ticking why right. it's not like it's gonna it's stop not, and wait for us well to yeah it's, okay yeah let's let them catch Come up on, let them catch up so, right it's moving faster so the gap is widening and unfortunately in every one of these areas we're talking about whether it be economics whether it be academics whether it be the demise of the black family whether it be the demise of the black neighborhoods you name it Every one of these areas are getting worse. They're not getting any better. So I don't want to be sound like we're just highlighting on the problem. But we're talking about the problem in a different perspective that should require us to act differently. And we have to act differently if we're going to change these dynamics. Because right. these dy- dynamics are not, they're, they're abnormal. They're absolutely off the chart abnormal dynamics that that are years in the making hundreds of years in the making well yeah you can't behave the same and expect a different result and we definitely got to make some changes we're going to take a break we're going to come back i want to know because i saw it come in but i have not unpacked it yet i want to know a little bit to give our readers what to anticipate about what we're going to be talking about with equity. And then I want to talk about our schools a little bit, Ryan. And I know today you had a meeting regarding one of our development projects. Can we talk sure. about that? One sure. Time? Sure. You know, now that we got two days on the air, four hours. Yeah, I, that's, I'm fine. I'm, I'm, I follow your lead. No problem. <laughs> You are listening to Universally Speaking with Raheem Islam on 860 AM WNOV, The Voice. Welcome back to Universally Speaking on 860 AM WNOV, The Voice. We're here with our host, Raheem Islam, in the studio. Don't adjust your radio dial. It's not Friday. It is Monday. We are now on on Mondays and Fridays from 3 p.m. until 5 p.m. right here on 860 AM WNLV. We are very excited. We always run out of time to discuss everything and also to share some of Raheem's column with you. So before we went to the break, I kind of uh, quickly talked about a few things that we're going to discuss when we came back in this last half hour. It's actually 426 drive time this is you know did you know this was drive time Raheem? drive time this is drive time all right <laughs> that's for people that actually end their day at, at five between five and six yeah I it's, it's, it's not drive time for us yeah <laughs> and for drive many, time to us is like 10 11 <laughs> and for a whole lot of us <laughs> at clock at night but yes this is considered drive time rush hour so i want to share a little bit of the latest uh installment of give the people what they want we want freedom, justice, and equality. This is actually part two. So this is the current issue that's actually out right now. And Raheem has actually already 
started. I saw it. I saw it pop up in my uh, inbox. The next installment for part three, where he deals with equality. I saw it come in, so that means it was heavy on his mind. It came in early. So this part that deals with justice, today blacks suffer from institutional racism and structural racism. Although there were no physical walls built to contain black people, the extreme racial pressures of forced segregation were enough to further economically weaken an already economic group, an already economically weak group. I wrote several articles on urban renewal and urban removal, and one on the key points and one of the key points that I tried to make is that the foundation of this phenomenon is the lack of real estate ownership. Going back nearly 100 years, blacks didn't own much of the homes that they resided in, and there were a number of orchestrated efforts to restrict wealth creation via real estate. There were the overwhelming loan rejections. Blacks were not able to get mortgages. There was the overwhelming number of canceled insurance policies. Blacks were not able to get homeowner's insurance, or which was a prerequisite for a mortgage. If justice was real for black people, this wouldn't be happening. Is this fair? Is this moral? Is this justice? Having a job that pays a living wage and includes benefits has been the cornerstone for wealth creation in America. If that cornerstone is compromised, reduced, and or removed, it fundamentally economically cripples the stabilization of the family, which is needed to promote and support the growth of its children. If you ask most successful entrepreneurs who and what they attribute their success to, most will say their parents. This usually means family structure that is supported by economic stability, a job. Like previous times, black men between 18 and 35 years of age, which is the common age of a husband, are experiencing unemployment at astronomical levels, 30 to 50 percent. Wow. It's all about economics. I mean, that and so, and I think that uh, what we have to do as a people is just, you know, we're studying uh, anecdotal information. Um, but the reality, we're not going to the source. And the source is the structure of these systems that uh, we're fighting. And we're fighting them, but they're structural, uh, um, structural and institutional racism and discrimination in our community against us as black people. Um, and one of the ways you can change that is you have to have more black people in those in, the, in those within those institutions. institutions, that's one way. But they can't be just black. They got to be conscious. So they they can't just be African American. Right, right. Which we have, <laughs> you know. Let's look at Clarence Thomas. <laughs> they can't be African American. They they can't be just African American. Right. They no. got to be African American and black. They got to be black. And so, and as I said before, and Huey Newton said, every Negro has an opportunity has the potential to become black. Uh, and every African-American has the potential to become black. But we need black people in those positions. So those are structural biases. Um, I have a meeting uh, on Thursday this week in Philadelphia to meet with the Philadelphia Inquirer, one of the largest uh, newspapers in the country, about their, here we're in 2015, and the lack of black writers in their in their organization, let alone black people on the editorial board. Wow, newspapers, and I'm sure the same same, same thing oh, exists here. Definitely, but how how is that? How is that? So that's structural, you know. And so, how are we going to fight all of these different fights? Organically, it ain't going to happen, right? How can we go out and fight now? We look at let's let's pull a, let's just look at the financial institutions and how do we rebuild our neighborhoods? How do we how do we uh, deal with and the structural deficiencies, racism in there? Because we want to use black contractors. Exactly. Sometimes you're not able to because of the laws, the standards, and things that they say you got to have. Yeah, right. Our black contractors won't have. Right. So to get around that, we we actually partner. We have our black contractors partner with white contractors. To build capacity. But guess what? 
We're bringing white contractors business, but those white contractors ain't bringing us no, no business. business. Right. It's one way. You're not gonna get. You're not gonna build any kind of really capital in a one-way transactional kind of situation. So these are all hurdles that we face in trying to figure it out. That's just one component. Every one of them, whether it be education, and we know the horrors of education and some of the challenges. Um, one of the one of the, if you're going to change the conditions on structural discrimination. You got to change the physical, visual look of the institution. You got to get black people. Now, remember, <laughs> not just African Americans. <laughs> black. You got to get black people who are thinking and who are proud who they are. Now, it's tough because we, we're operating on a little bit of information. But that's enough. Right. Start. Because my mama taught me certain things. And that's good enough. But if you didn't have a mama, you're struggling because you could just you could just be an accomplished African American and exactly. have no blackness in you. Exactly. I mean, look at this nut. Uh, well, I ain't gonna say that, but so, yeah, I'll say that. <laughs> this, you know, like Carson. I mean, what what the hell is he talking about? Or look at the guy. Was it Tim Scott in Carolina, the one who got the um, the senator? Yes. I heard some of the nonsense. This guy's talking. What, what world? What? First of all, I thought he was a white man. <laughs> and then I looked. I said, this guy's black. No, well, he's no, not no, black. No, he's African American. <laughs> now, I'm always sip up and say he's an in, but I ain't go that far. But, you know, he's a fool. He's a fool. So, so and it's not enough. You got to be African American by designation. Right. You got to be black by choice. Right. All right. And we need people who are black by choice in positions in order for us to begin to change the conditions of structural discrimination and structural racism. So if it looks biased, if you look at the canvas and you see nothing but white people and hardly any black people, that that's the first war that has to be waged. That's the right. first battle that has to be waged. If it looks like a duck, walk like a duck. Well, you got you got to go. You got to you got to deal with that right then. And so, right. Call so, 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 when we are out here fighting and seeing the impact of, they look at us like we crazy. They're not going to come and and save us. They're not going to say, okay, you know what? Guess what? You know what? Ain't enough black people at this courier. I mean the. Uh, <laughs> the Sorry, that was a slip. No, I, I look at the word courier. It's not but black people the courier. Now, the white people are saying that we need to have some white people to carry it. No, no, no. What's the name of the Milwaukee uh, people? Milwaukee Community Journal. I mean, no, the yeah, Journal City. No, I got you all messed up. <laughs> I don't drink the Kool Aid. So, the Journal Sentinel. Journal Sentinel. Now, you think they're going to say, let's go to the NAACP and say, look, we want to meet with the NAACP and says, well, what's the meeting for? Well, we want to hire more black people. Because it just ain't enough. It, it just ain't enough, <laughs> ain't enough black people. We don't even feel right. <laughs> we can't sleep at night. <laughs> I'm having restless nights. Now, you go figure that one out. Or you come to the, the, the financial institution that says, you know what? We're going to come to you and say, you know what? We done wrong. We just got our earnings we, report. We, we, we done done wrong, and we're tired of doing this wrong. We want to operate some kind of fairness. And guess what we're going to do? In the next year, we're going to hire 10,000 more black people. Or at least the percentage of black people that bank with us. The bottom line is that it ain't going to happen. <laughs> All right? So the first battle for us is to deal with the visual. The structural discrimination will never be addressed if we don't deal with structural bias. We have to have black people in positions of influence. And there is a uh, there in, in the private sector, we are completely wiped out, completely. And you take the top 5,000 corporations or take the top 500 companies right here in Milwaukee. And you say each one of those companies have what they call the CEO suite. Mm -hmm. So they have the CEO, the COO, the CFO, the whatever. Mm -hmm. These are the people who make decisions. I would guarantee you that we're probably less than one one percent make up of, and so that's where the 
battle has to be waged that right there. That is an obvious, you're never going to deal with the structural racism. It's there. It's already there. If they're not going to hire you, they're not going to include you, you're not in the decision making, there's no way in the world you're going to change those conditions. So this is what we've inherited in America. We've inherited, I call it, we're on autopilot. We've inherited structural practices that have now excluded and hurt and damaged our community. And we, we don't have no choice. We have no way to even deal with it. There's a couple ways we can deal with it, but one way we have to look at it for what it is. And then we have to also know that they're not going to change for themselves. They're only going to change is when we change them. And so the real rumble is going to be on the structural bias that exists in many of these different institutions. So that's real justice. That's real justice. And we always talk about another thing that I love and enjoy and I really do enjoy the work that I do. I don't know if you know that. but I really Of course. Do. I know you do. I really do. Yeah. I really enjoy the work that I do. But I really, one of the reasons why I really enjoy it is because we don't just talk and highlight and promote the problem. You know, oh, it's just so horrible. It's just terrible. And these are the issues and these are problems. But we actually not just talk about what we can do to make it better, but we implement those things. And but also I want to say that even in talking about the problem, we're talking about it from a different perspective. We're not complaining. No, about no, it. we're just we're just telling the truth. Identifying the people it. want the truth and nothing else. Right. And the truth of the matter is that you got to look at economics. You got to look at freedom, justice, and equality differently. The right than what you've been. Looking so at it. the way we've been looking at it, because if you don't have economic freedom, you're not free. Right. You may think I'm free. I'm I'm a free. Yeah, I, no, I you you free to I hurt yourself, do. right? But you're not free to advance your causes, right? You're not free to to, to determine your self determination, Nation. which means basically I'm going to chart the path for your people for the next five thousand years, right? I'm able to. I'm not even to even define. I don't even know what I can do, right? Let alone my generation to come, me, right? You can't even control. You can't even control what your children going to do. Because you have no capacity to do it. So you're not free. You're not free until you're economically free in America. Exactly. So what I would like to do is for us to talk about some of the things that we are doing and that we can do starting individually and collectively. And that the reason why we get this information out and the reason why you write the articles that you write and I'm unpack them the way that you do and you know you know i got a call this morning um from a uh <laughs> you know people say long time first time caller long time listener have you ever heard, have you ever heard that mm -hmm. um, so i got a call saying you know raheem's articles are just so long but you know once you start reading them you just you have to keep reading them and but they just so long <laughs> and i said well but if you stay engaged it's like they're just so educational you just learn so much from them and so you know i just encourage the person to keep reading and well i'm i'm you know i'm gonna start shortening them too so i'm i'm trying to figure out how to do that I, i'm i'm, I'm going to start shorten them but uh, they said they can't put them down but they want to put them down because yeah but <laughs> i get that criticism all the time though you know i it's not like i don't hear it um uh, I hear it loud and clear, you know. Um, but the bottom line is that, um, again, I, 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 my fallback is I'm not a writer, you know. I'm, I'm just a, uh, I'm just a frustrated black man, <laughs> you know. And this is your way of venting. Well, and not only that, but I'm really uncovering things that I know are new for me. Right. You and want so, to share them with like right, right. If, if they knew, new stuff, you right. want to share if with they, everybody. If they knew for me, I'm almost sure they knew for most people. So what I want to talk about is, um, first of all, it's a beautifully warm, hot day outside. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and it's so blessed to have air conditioning in the studio. It would really be nice to enjoy some of that air. <clears throat> and all of our beautiful things that we're working on so one of the things i want to talk about we talked about real estate and we talked about well we, we we're looking at doing some really um um 
significant real estate development. So so stay tuned. Um, okay. We're we're in partnership with uh, the Morris Group to do the Garfield project, which is something that's going to happen. Um, uh, housing development, mixed use in development Bronzeville. in Bronzeville on North Avenue, uh, Fourth and Garfield, but it's going to also spill out on North Avenue with the the redevelopment of the Black Holocaust Museum. So that's something we're looking at doing. Uh, Universal and Morris made application to participate in the city's uh, scatter site development project uh, or uh, initiative, uh, which we think uh, over the next you know several months we'll we'll break ground on something you know ten to fifteen units we'll be doing there. Uh, but we're also working on planning some efforts to do a little bit more master planning in areas. Uh, uh, that's going to be, I think that you know, it's going to show and demonstrate some of the things that we are looking to do, specifically around our schools. Okay. Uh, so, so master phys- planning, phys- phys- physical development. If people don't know what that is, what is master planning? Well, master planning basically is creating a a a a, a plan of ac- action that uh, takes in consideration the opportunities and the strengths and also the weaknesses of any neighborhood. So, uh, what does the community need? Um, uh, whether it's housing, what type of housing, whether it's affordable, whether it's market rate housing, uh, whether it's rental, whether it's home ownership or a combination of all of those, uh, it takes into consideration um, um, where to start, um, where you should start, where you get the best bang for your buck. Um, um, the goal of, um, um, of master planning is to create a situation where the market um, – can now sustain itself. Um, Normally in our neighborhoods, they're so suppressed, uh, financially they're so suppressed, they're unable to the market able to do anything. So as a result, they stay, they get the further and further weakened because uh, 10 vacant properties become 15, then 15 becomes 20, and then next you know, you're looking at the housing stock, they start to deteriorate, and before they start to deteriorate, that's how they actually, uh, you know, become vacant. They, They become so bad that Nobody can do anything with, with them, them, so they have to leave. Um, and so um, the market usually would take care of those situations. But in our situation where the cost of construction is higher than the cost of what you can pay. Okay. So, for example, if, if it costs $100, the most you could pay is $50. Okay. Well, that gap is a market gap that will prevent private investment. From coming in. From coming in. So... Uh, the master plan looks at all those things and try to now figure out how to jumpstart the, the, the market, how to infuse the market, and where to infuse the market, what type of housing, what it looked like, and then uh, sustained over a period of time will build that that community yep. back up. So basically a master plan looks at how to do some development, but how to make it be successful, not how to just start something and do a few little things and they right. run it out, but, but how to make it be successful. Absolutely, because, thing. and m- what we do is try to do it connected to people. Okay. A lot of master planning is done just physical development. So they just say build it and they'll come. Yeah, and what we say, well, who are those people? Who are they? We <laughs> want the certain type of people. We want people who are going to, uh, who are conscious. Right. We want families who are conscious. We have to create that model. Okay. That model where uh, the um People can live, play, and work in their own neighborhoods. Right. They can go to school in their n- own neighborhoods. Okay. They don't have to get on buses and, and be transported miles away to get quality education. Okay. They don't have to pay millions of dollars to get quality housing. Right. It could be affordable. affordable. Um, so all those things come into play in our master plan. Okay. So in this master planning, one of the first uh neighborhoods that you're looking at doing is around one of our schools correct uh all of the schools um okay. yeah but definitely um um uh, there are definitely um some areas uh we've been uh looking at in in milwaukee i don't want to say where, where because um one of the things people that, will be like that well, was they, start first you know <laughs> He said you was going to do this one. Our white developer friends, <laughs> they, they be like, we right over there. I said, damn, I thought well, we had. Like, <laughs> you no. like, you going to hit see the shovel going yeah, in the I ground. Know. I was like, damn, I'm, I was ready to go over there. They, they got it done because they got resources. Right, right. You know, um, right. and so um, 
Um, but but for the most part, uh, there are a, 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 a couple of neighborhoods in the, in, the in the community that we're looking at. But uh, and you know what? There's a whole lot of communities in oh, without Milwaukee that need. Trust so, me. So they can trust just take. Me. They can just trust take me. a it, it, throw it in. <laughs> I mean, it's not too many uh, black communities that not struggling in the co- in the entire country. So uh, they're the same characteristics. But master planning, we're we're doing some of that. But again, it's just not schools. It's just not schools. Schools are very important, very critical. We have to change the narrative on our schools, on, on the expectation of our young people. They got to believe in America. Right now, they're being, they're being, you know, delivered a content that ultimately, by a, a certain age, they stop believing. Exactly. You know, um, Earth, Wind, and Fire says uh, the way of the world. Uh, a child is born world. with a heart of gold. And the way the world turns the heart cold. That that turning is a process. And we want to keep our young people inspired, energized, even though they're leaving the school and going to some some sometimes serious and, and really um, um, not unsafe home life. Right. But then our goal is to try to help them with their home life. Right. We have our family student resource Center. centers in our schools to try to broker resources for our adult, our parents, and our community with, via the school. Right, so we can help bridge that gap right. and so, be so support system e- for the entire family. Exactly, because we, we want that child. Right. We don't want to lose that child. No. And we, we know that the child is in an environment that's not as stable as it needs to be. Um so those are some of the things going back to solutions that right. we're doing. But none of them pale in comparison to what we can do if we were organized. Right. We could do much more, much quicker, and much more significant and much more comprehensive if we were organized. And that's I'm never going to leave that fight, even though I got schools to run and we got development to do. I see myself my one of my biggest role is bringing the people together because that's where our strength lies so when people ask me well what is it that universal does the three things that i tell them or even if they ask me what raheem does i tell them um education management which is managing schools Mm -hmm. um and i tell them you know no he's not in the classroom teaching (laughs) <laughs> he has a team. I of, will. Uh, he's a team. I of have. <laughs> he's a team of professionals that uh, handle our education. But uh, we've been talking. Right. You and I have been talking about um, our mentorship with yeah, our young the, boys. Yes, definitely. And so I. And you I, did some stuff on actually this past week. You went and uh, spoke. Well, I, I'm gonna do more right, with our right. young boys. Yes. But you know, yes. but no, traditionally, no, yeah. I'm not a teacher. He's not teaching no. science classes. No, no. You're, you're right. I don't think I can handle those kids. <laughs> to be honest with you. <laughs> And the second thing I tell people is real estate development um, and neighborhood development, redevelopment. But the third thing I tell them is community organizing. Absolutely. And, uh, that those are the three things and you can't go anywhere. You're not going to find those three bullet points. But that's my elevator speech. That's what I've gathered from sitting with uh, Mr. Gamble and sitting with Raheem and talking and putting this whole thing together is that those are the three areas uh, that we focus on and that we're doing not just in Philadelphia, but definitely here in Milwaukee and have been doing. Well, here's here's the thing that I, I want our listeners to kind of understand, and especially those who have school age children, um, they can send our, their children to our school. Uh, we're trying to create a movement. Uh, and using education as the catalyst for that movement. Um, if you can just imagine, um, uh, for those who are old enough to remember when the schools were a, 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 a central part of community development, we want to restore that, number one. Uh, we want the schools to be a place for resources for everyone, for our children, obviously, and also but for their parents, and also for those people in the community who don't have children in right. the school. Uh, we want to see those schools become the hubs for, for that kind of community change. But we also want to create uh, sustainable strategies that that are carried out when our children. One of the things we've seen uh, and, and, and significantly and kind of we kind of probably truly did not understand is the growth of our how 
fast these children grow. I mean, they grow fairly quickly. I mean, you have a, a baby one day, and, and a couple of years later, that you know that person is graduating high school. Right. They, they don't take long. Twelve years is not a long time. No, to it commit to a strategy that we can now create be a part of this movement we're talking about a movement that's going to deal with the issues of freedom justice and equality freedom economic freedom that means what it's not so much what they're doing to us is what we're not doing justice we're going to have to demand justice we're going to have to attack justice at its lowest limbs we can't go at the highest and the most invisible one is structural discrimination and racism because nobody's going to listen to us All right. But there are some fights we can take. And then equality. I didn't talk much about equality, but I'm going to talk about it next, next, and, 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 and Friday. next, maybe Friday. But the bottom line, I wrote about equality. And there's one concept called equality called quality of quantity. Just quality of quantity. And that means if we're 13% of the population, we should have 13% of the nation's resources. We own less than one half of one percent of the nation's resources i calculated to that be almost a 24 trillion dollar gap that's our reality same thing if we're 13 percent of the, the nation's population on equality quantity equality that means we should only be 13 percent of the nation's problems and that's in not. many of the cases we're 60 70 percent of the nation's problems in different areas and it's just not equality but we're not going to change these things by just knowing them. One, you got to know them, and the, the, we got to know them and what they do and how they work before you can come up with strategies. So the third leg of universal is organizing our community. community. We have to organize our community because there's no other way to deal with these massive issues that we're challenged with. This generation is challenged with, unlike other generations before us, those were in before segregation or in segregation or integration they were they had more to work with exactly. and i talked earlier i says while the problems are growing the the resources and the strategies that they had we don't have to work with we we don't have mother they didn't have the the, the minds of the black family like we do they didn't have massive because segregation at least put us all together we were together we were we, community we had we were a family. stronger business community I just found out in Baltimore when I was reading, I went into the museum, the Baltimore, they had a brother there who, who had an airline. Come on. <laughs> Come on. That was a bad brother. Where y'all need to go? I mean, he had his own airline. <laughs> Taking like, I think it was like 140 flights a week. So we had entrepreneurs and we did things for ourselves when we could not have nobody else doing anything for us. We did for us. We had our own community. We, to we come did. Together and so make things happen. we don't have those things today, but we have the same problems or worse. So we don't have that 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 working together. We got to rebuild that infrastructure. We got to rebuild the protocol between generations working with each other. We got to respect our elders, elders. and listen to our elders. And but they got to be able in a a, a way so that as I, I transition to become an elder. Somebody said you was transitioned last week on your birthday. They said, oh. okay, uh, they said, okay, elder. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I'm just, go ahead, go ahead. <laughs> well, hey, look, I don't see myself as no elder because I know there's a lot of other brothers and sisters out there who I look up as elders. But I'm sure there are people that, I, that look up to me. Um, and, um, you know, at some point, we got to just transfer this knowledge, knowledge where we're not starting over. Every, yes. Again. Because, again, I remember I said the race, it continues. It's not going any way. The only way we're going to close that gap, we're going to close the information gap. we got to close the, 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 the gap about knowledge and, and, and wisdom and, and understanding. So now we can unpack these concepts of freedom, justice, and equality and really look at them for what they really are. And then apply today's knowledge and information to them as opposed to just, again, giving this young next generation something to work with as opposed to they inherited not only poverty, but they inherited a dysfunction. They're inheriting a, a, a protocols that are completely going against what is needed in any kind of uniform effort. 
So everything they're inheriting, they're inheriting, is no question that the problems are going to worsen because what they're inheriting are not equipping them to be able to compete. Yes. So, you know what? Is that the right time? It is the right time. Two hours. It flew by. Does anybody know what time it is? <laughs> Does anybody really care? So that's for you, for you, for you young people. Y'all, y'all don't know what I'm talking about. See, so, see I was a Chicago fan, uh, the, the group Chicago. <laughs> y'all was like, don't start. That. Yeah, the, 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 the group Bucks and the Bulls. Yeah, just yeah, no, 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 no. Don't the, start that. The, don't start the, that. The, the, the musical group Chicago, and they had a song. Does anybody really know what time it is? So, one reference, we had a meeting where someone referred to the lighted schoolhouse, and Milwaukee used to be referred to as the city of the lighted schoolhouse. So, we're going to talk about that Friday. Um, that meeting we had about our schools being that and bringing Oh, that right. The, the, the whole community, community school. Yeah, community that's, that's what it's called. Okay. Yeah, see, lit, lit after... Yeah. Hours, right, right. Yeah. So that when it gets dark, that schoolhouses are, and we at one time were referred to as the city of the light. Well, we're going to restore it back. Universal's attempting to do that. Um, we're not there yet, but we're getting there. We're getting I mean, there. we're everything. Also, we I need talked the about energies to cut us a break. Well, we not only that. We <laughs> need we need to we need to work together. We have to work together. We have to create a place where we can all work together. Um, and um, I remember saying something, um, I'm not sure who said it, but I think oh yeah, it, was, it was Harry Truman. Harry Truman said that we can get much more work done if we're not worried about who gets the credit. Um, right. We have to be have that kind of concept. The only ones going to get the credit is our children. They're going to benefit from, from it. it. And it ain't about nobody getting any credit. You know, and right now we in an environment of uh, uh, some of our older uh, black people who are uh, running around with their heads cut off because they worried about who gets credit. Um, they worried about uh, if they're not being mentioned or they worrying about if they're not in the room. Look, I don't even care if we if I'm not in the room. I don't even want to be mentioned. All I want to see is it, it get done. done. And so there are other black people like that. Those we got to surround ourselves with. We're not worried about who gets the credit. We're worried about getting the work done. So that's our time for today. We will be back on Friday. Same place, same station, same time. We thank you for listening. I know you have a special shout out that you want to give. <gasps> we did not do our digital libation. So I we're going to do it now at I the know. end. We're going to do it now. And I'm going to let you do it. Well, you have a shout out that you always give at the end of the show. I want to. I just yeah. My main shout out to my main man. I can't. I can't go too far uh, uh, in in Milwaukee without uh, really talking about uh, my main man, Mr. Jones, and, and all the things uh, the WNOV and uh, the Courier means to this community. Uh, we're coming on a big celebration that we want to talk about and promote and push. Not for Mr. Jones, although we want to do it for Mr. Jones, but we want to do it for us as a people. Um, and so all those who will come before us, uh, I know we hear it all the time. We've got to keep hearing it. We've got to keep hearing it. got to keep hearing it. Uh, it, it. Where you start matters. And when we look at the starting line, we had a people who are, who are no longer here. And they're not here anymore. But they paved the way, and they would be um, absolutely upset. If they understood that they the sacrifices they made for us, they made, and we're now squandering those sacrifices. So um, for all of our ancestors, we pay homage to you. Uh, we ask the, the Almighty Creator to make your, your place a warm and comfortable one. And we ask the Almighty Creator to, to strengthen and, and, and widen our breast and, 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 exp and increase our heart and our capacity to withstand um, and, and to do more um, just like you did, our ancestors did um, in this time, in this day, and for these challenges we face today. I say. <laughs>